Hola, muy buenos días a, a todos. En primer lugar, muchísimas gracias por venir en esta maravillosa mañana de otoño. Yo soy Rubén Gutiérrez, soy el director del Departamento de Investigación y Desarrollo de la Fundación SGAE y desde el Instituto Autor me pidieron que presentase al ponente con el que ustedes van a tener el gusto de compartir las siguientes horas, Dimitar Ganchev. Para mí esta invitación es todo un honor. Uh, yo ya ni recuerdo desde cuándo conozco a Dimitar Ganchev, probablemente más de 15 años. Él es, bueno, él es el subdirector del Departamento de Infraestructuras del Copyright y en concreto es el responsable de la sección de Industrias Creativas dentro de la OMPI, pero más allá del nombre preciso de su cargo, les debo contar a ustedes que es una de las personas que para los que trabajamos en economía de la cultura, por fin aparece este concepto que va a ser básico a lo largo de la sesión de esta mañana, repito, para todos los que trabajamos en economía de la cultura, Dimiter es una de las personas absolutamente fundamentales. Evidentemente las instituciones son lo más fundamental, gracias a que existe la OMPI se pueden hacer una serie de trabajos, pero gracias a que existen personas como Dimiter, Dentro de organizaciones como la OMPI, este tipo de trabajos se hacen con un rigor increíble y sobre todo se sostienen en el tiempo. Uno muchas veces se preguntaría qué serían de estos trabajos, que ahora les comentaré eh, de manera muy breve, él ya los profundizará después, pero qué sería de estos trabajos y de la continuidad en el tiempo si no hubiese detrás una persona como el señor Dimitar Ganchev asegurándose el rigor, la continuidad y el mimo en el desarrollo, insisto, de estos trabajos. ¿Por qué eh, os preguntaréis, bueno Rubén, y esto entonces, por qué es tan importante Dimitar y los trabajos que hacen? Bueno, pues precisamente... Eras una vez los años 80 y los años 90 en los que el, la cultura ya no se peleaba en términos políticos o en términos estrictamente culturales, sino que tuvo que buscar una serie de estrategias y de lenguajes para poderse pelear en las grandes instituciones. Y en aquellos momentos el principal discurso predominante era el discurso económico. La cultura hizo un esfuerzo importante en intentar conocerse a sí misma desde la perspectiva económica. Es decir, ya la cultura sabe más o menos lo que es, sabe más o menos lo que aporta a la sociedad en términos de cohesión social, en términos de desarrollo, en términos de creatividad, pero en ese lenguaje absolutamente monotemático de finales de los años 80 y la primera mitad de los años 90, lo que lo único que importaba aparentemente era una mala concepción de la economía, la cultura no sabía desarrollarse en ese lenguaje y se pusieron en marcha una serie de trabajos en distintos países. Aquí en España, desde la Fundación SGAE, trabajamos con el Departamento de Análisis Económico de la Universidad Autónoma en el año 97 para hacer el primer trabajo para conocer cuánto suponía la cultura en el Producto Interior Bruto y justo en esas fechas, desde el Departamento de Industrias Culturales, Industrias Creativas de la OMPI, empezaron a poner en marcha lo que ha devenido a lo largo de los años en el estándar de la metodología para conocer las aportaciones a las economías nacionales. ¿no? Desde el departamento que dirige Dimiter y bajo su personal asesoramiento, insisto, mimo y cariño, hoy por ejemplo está relajado y esta noche la va a pasar en Madrid, pero otras veces que ha venido tanto a Madrid como en unas conferencias que organizamos con él en el Escorial, esa misma tarde tenía que coger el avión a lugares muy remotos y solamente estaba, lamentablemente, cinco horas porque tenía que irse a, a hacer el seguimiento de estudios que se estaban haciendo en Sudáfrica, por ejemplo. ¿no? Estos trabajos que ellos han puesto en marcha bajo la supervisión de Dimiter permiten, en cierta medida, poder comparar cuál es el estado de las industrias basadas en el copyright o los derechos de autor en la aportación a las economías y poderlo comparar entre los distintos países y a lo largo del tiempo. Gracias a estos trabajos han podido sacar algunas conclusiones que seguro el propio Dimiter presentará y además de estos trabajos de una naturaleza macroeconómica, también desde su departamento están ahora desarrollando otras nuevas metodologías para intentar medir también con 
con, evidentemente con rigor económico el impacto de la piratería. Están haciendo también trabajos específicos sobre distintas áreas como el management, el cómo hacer cómo poder desarrollar una carrera profesional a través de la explotación de los derechos de autor, etc. Es un trabajo tremendo al que debemos agradecer, por supuesto, a la OMP y la dedicación, pero en concreto, impersonalmente, a mí me gustaría eh, que ustedes pudiesen disfrutar de estos próximos minutos con Dimiter. Yo personalmente le quiero agradecer el trabajo, el mimo, la dedicación y el compromiso personal, que aunque seamos economistas aburridos y demás, si no hay ese compromiso personal y ese profundo amor sobre lo que está debajo de las cifras, sería prácticamente imposible poder llevar esto con cierta alegría como con la que lo lleva el señor Ganchev. El señor Ganchev creo que os va a hablar en inglés, él sabe perfectamente castellano, vaya, conoce un montón de idiomas, pero se hace así un poco más el interesante. Eh, es encantador y ya sin más os dejo con él. Muchísimas gracias, Dimitri, muchísimas gracias a todos vosotros. Muchas gracias, Adriana. Hola, buenos días. <laughs> no, I'm going to speak in English, as Ruben said. Um, it is indeed a privilege to be here. It's so great to see so many young and interested people in copyright and economics. Um, I understand that uh, this is not the first lecture in the course, so uh, by now you already know what WIPO is. Um, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Adriana, for inviting me here. Uh, to give you this uh, discourse on a slightly different angle of copyright. Um, I understand that by now you know everything about copyright in terms of uh, legal concepts uh, and in terms of the legal side of copyright, you know everything. So uh, I will try to tell you something which you may not have dealt with so far. I would like to focus on, on, on copyright as an economic asset today and to talk about copyright and the economy and about copyright and the market. And I hope that this will be uh, useful for expanding your horizon uh, in terms of the role and potential that copyright can play. Oops, that was a little too fast. Uh, we are going to go back to the beginning. Uh, what I would like to do is uh, to say a few words in the beginning about some of the conceptual underpinnings. I would like to speak about the creative economy, I'd like to speak about creativity, intellectual property, and copyright. There's a lot of terminology, sometimes it's overlapping, so let's see if we can put some order into that. Uh, we will also discuss a little bit the economic fundamentals of copyright. Uh, why is copyright an economic category and what are some of the consequences from that? Then I would like to turn to some of the results of the empirical work that we have done in WIPO, um, the underpinning concepts for this work and the results of that and uh, a little bit of analysis of these results. Uh, then I would like, would like to project those results and how do they compare with other existing Uh, economic indicators and see if there are some relationships which are worth discussing. And finally, I will tell you about uh, some of the results uh, of the perceptions and some of the misperceptions that exist in terms of copyright, uh, its role and potential in the economy. So why do we bother about economic analysis of copyright? Uh, WIPO is uh, one of the United Nations agencies, and um, we have a special responsibility for the development of copyright law. We have 187 member states, these are governments, and in recent years these governments have been coming to us and asking us, uh, can you come up with some mechanism, some way of showing exactly how much copyright contributes to the economy? Uh, Could we find some proof that uh, copyright actually is a driver of our uh, economy and can be a driver for achieving our development objectives? 
In other words, if we are more creative, will this necessarily translate into economic growth? Can you prove that? So in response to that, of course, we have started thinking, uh, what is the way of proving that copyright actually is directly linked to economic performance? Um, on the other hand, uh, copyright is very well linked to culture, as Ruben said. And uh, we know that it contributes to our uh, social life, to our cultural enrichment. Uh, but is there something over and beyond that uh, social and cultural side? Is there an economic side to it? That's another set of arguments that uh, have underpinned the research that we, we have been doing. Uh, creative industries also is a positive agenda. All governments want to talk about positive things, I can assure you. Nobody wants to talk about unemployment. But creative industries is great. It's a green agenda. It's positive. Who doesn't want to talk about creative industries? Of course, there is a danger that uh, sometimes people say, through creative industries, we will solve all of our problems. Well, creative industries is not a fire brigade. It can solve some problems, but not all problems. But here again, uh, you do have a, a set of issues uh, uh, which need to be discussed. Uh, can creative industries operate just on the basis of copyright and uh, will they achieve what we hope them to achieve in society? Uh, perhaps not if there is no supporting infrastructure around them. So what are the elements of this infrastructure? These are questions that have been raised to us by governments and we felt that uh, there was a need to engage in empirical research in order to be able to prove or wrong, uh, to be able to prove right or wrong these assertions. Now, what does uh, intellectual property have to do with creativity? Um, if I tell you that uh, uh, without uh, intellectual property there will be no creativity, that would be an exaggeration, because there were great periods of history when there was a lot of creativity, but there was no intellectual property. So, uh, in fact, I don't think that we have uh, empirical proof that we are more creative than our ancestors two or three hundred years ago. We just cannot prove that. So what has changed then in terms of creativity? Uh, I think what has changed, of course, is technology. We have that. But even more importantly, what has changed today is that we have developed new conceptual frameworks. One of these conceptual frameworks is the concept of intellectual property and copyright. And through this, con through this concept, through this framework, it is much easier to transform creative outputs into economic goods and services. It is much more easy to monitor what is the demand and supply of creative creativity and in this way to get an idea of what is the impact of creativity on, on development. And indeed, intellectual property today has become something very important. Governments, major investors, always look at the level of intellectual property protection when they assess the level of development of a country. Now, creative economy, another term which has come into use into the last 10 to 15 years. How do you define the creative economy? I can assure you that there is no universal definition of what is the creative economy. I think in, in the broadest sense, most certainly when we talk about the creative economy, we are referring to this big uh, network of relationships in the creative society, in the knowledge society, creative people, creative cities, creative industries, creative infrastructure. And it has turned out to be a very powerful term. Um, if you Google it, uh, I think you will find uh, several million hits on, on creative economy, much more than on copyright today. And um, it is a term which links cultural and economic policy together. So it has a great outreach potential. And uh, in defining the creative economy, of course you have different approaches. One would be the broadest approach, that everything is creative. In that sense, creative economy, this is the economy of the future. It's very difficult to define 
where are the borders of this economy if you define it through such a broad approach. Because you would put technology, legal, all kinds of very incoherent elements together in the definition, and it makes it very difficult to, to define what are we talking about. Uh, very clearly, this is linked to, to policy agendas. Now, there's another approach, which is the narrow approach, to define the creative economy through one criteria, be it culture, be it um, intellectual property, uh, be it innovation, uh, etc. Uh, the nice thing about this more narrow approach is that you know exactly what you're talking about. There is a very clear criteria in this case. And usually this criteria is linked to a database of information. So there is information which is produced in a coherent way, which is very important if you want to measure. And um, we don't know what the definition will be. As I said, there is no fixed definition of the creative economy. But what we know that most likely in the future, this definition will be a multidisciplinary one. So we will have more than one disciplines involved. And we know that the, this will be, uh, the denominator will be innovative processes. This looks like something which nobody questions. And we have to keep in mind that whatever we define and however we define it, we are talking about a part of our real life, about a part of the economy, which exists. It's not a parallel economy. It's here. And uh, it's just another way of describing one existing portion of today's economy. Now, what does copyright have to do with all of that? As you know, copyright is uh, one of the uh, branches of intellectual property, most probably the topic of your thesis. Uh, and um, as I said, it is very difficult to describe precisely creativity. It is a subjective decision. Who am I to decide that somebody is more creative than another person? It's a very subjective thing. Whereas um, when we talk about copyright, we know that copyright came about in order to protect and promote creative expressions. So whatever is protected under copyright fits into my understanding of creativity. So at least I am certain that the area protected by copyright is creative and I can prove it because that's how the definition has been made. We know exactly what copyright is. Copyright is defined in the national law of each country. And we know this, this is a set of uh, economic and moral rights, a set of rights which enable the right holder or the creator to monitor and to allow the uses of his or her work. We also know that copyright is a concept that works. It's the basis of huge industries. It's a way of making a living for many creators. So it is a living concept. It is something which is part of real life. It operates and it is possible to define it very clearly. Now, if copyright is a legal concept, it's a social construct, as you know, um, do we have the case to make it also the subject of, uh, of an economic study? And what are some of the underpinning economic fundamentals of copyright? Well, first of all, uh, the most important economic characteristic of copyright is that this is a property right. It's a private property right. And that's very important uh, to note because any property can participate in economic transactions only when it is very clear what are the boundaries of that property. If I don't know who owns something, I cannot possibly trade with it. So the most important characteristic is that it's a private property right. For us, this is fundamental. But at the same time, we should not forget that copyright also has some public good aspects. What does, uh, what does this mean? Well, this means that you can share the property and this does not diminish its value. So you listen to a song, many people listen to a song, this does not diminish the value of the asset. So it has some public good aspects. And when talking about uh, the economic characteristics of copyright, we should not forget that we are talking about the protection of content, not physical objects. It's the song that is protected, it's not the CD. It's the story, it's not the book. So these are important considerations in terms of describing the economic characteristics of copyright. 
what is the economic function of copyright? Well, the most important economic function is that it establishes the rules of the game. This is the framework. It tells you how the market will operate. Here is what is allowed to be done. Here are the exceptions. And here is how you can trade with that property. So in other words, this is a mechanism which helps the right holder uh, to trade with his intellectual property. It allows him to, it allows the creator to appropriate whatever the market is prepared to pay for the property. So it's a facilitating mechanism. It's, um, it establishes, as I said, the rules of the game. What are some of the economic consequences of copyright? Well, of course, to the extent to which it supports innovation uh, and creativity, uh, it helps society to achieve the broader social welfare objectives. That's the, on, the, on the very broad level. But at the same time, one of the consequences, which I'm sure you're very well aware of, is that copyright provides you with a limited monopoly over your property. It's a limited, limited monopoly right. And um, that is um, very important because it increases the ability of the owner to exercise some market power. He can decide what will be the price. He can decide what will be the levels of access to the property. To some he allows more access, to others he allows less access. So this is something which operates in a different way, and that's a very important economic consequence. In macroeconomic term, of course, co copyright contributes to redistributing income uh, between different groups of society. Imagine that you change the royalty rates. That means that you redirect one portion of the income to another group in society. So you have this function of influencing on a macroeconomic level the, um, the <coughs> income and costs in society. Finally, what are the conditions for this concept to work? How can it be efficient? You know, there's something which is called economic efficiency. And of course, the first condition is that uh, um, the, the cost for uh, the production and distribution uh, should be uh, uh, less than the uh, consumer valuation. The consumer should value your product at a price which is higher than the cost for the production and distribution. Otherwise, it doesn't make economic sense, right? But there's one other condition for efficiency, one other very important condition for the concept to work, is that you have to monitor the level of misuse. In other words, if there's too much piracy, unfortunately, the concept cannot bring back the benefits to the right holder, which were uh, embedded in the concept. So if we have this uh, in mind, uh, perhaps we can analyze copyright from an economic point of view, and uh, we can treat it as an economic category. Now, where does this property uh, operate? It operates on the market. Creative markets are something which you're very familiar with on a daily or minute-by-minute minute basis almost. Let's look at them from their, uh, from their demand and supply side. Um, if you look on the from the demand side, uh, the most important characteristic of, uh, of copyright and of creative products is the an unpredictability of demand. Nobody knows whether there will be a market for your song or for your novel. You, you create something, but you're never sure whether there's going to be a demand for it. So there's a great level of uncertainty, and that needs to be taken into account in any kind of market analysis. Of course, today with the digital, you have a lot of interaction, so you can get a feel almost immediately of the demand of the product, but uncertainty is likely to remain a principal characteristic of demand. In the past, we used to say that quality matters, that people used to buy quality things. If you look at uh, what kind of demand exists today uh, on digital networks, I'm not so sure that quality really matters. People go after anything, uh, but at least in theory, uh, people would, would be interested into quality stuff. How do you define quality is another issue. Price matters. Yes, indeed, uh, but uh, today uh, I'm not sure that this is still the major characteristic of demand. Why? Because uh, people are not prepared to pay any price for the product. 
in fact, they don't want to pay any price. They want access to the property, and they do not want to pay any price for it. So price used to matter, but not anymore. There is a major change which is happening there. Now, local and global interplay, what is meant here? Usually you have some uh, mega stars uh, which are operating on global level, so they create trends. And those trends are influencing heavily <coughs> local markets as well. Uh, so sometimes <coughs> things are happening not in your country, somewhere else, but there's a major impact on the local market. And finally, piracy. Piracy is something which exists. And um, we do have to speak about that uh, because it translates into less creative content which is being offered to the, to the public. Uh, and you can see that by the number of uh, new artists that are signed up by the, by the majors and by, by companies. So uh, these are some characteristics of, of demand. What do we have on the supply side? The most uh, important characteristic of supply is that uh, we are treating here with differentiated products. What does that mean? That means that there is no direct substitution. I cannot replace one song with another because I like that particular song. It's a matter of experience. So there's no substitution. These are differentiated products. Secondly, what we know is that um, there is a very low marginal cost of delivery. With the digital networks, it's basically zero. Why is this important? Because in the past, one used to price based on the marginal um, or the mar on the marginal cost, but marginal cost is zero now, so you cannot price on that. Entry barriers. Today, you put your song on YouTube, you're already in the market, you're in competition. It's not like investing in, into the development of a new car. So the, the entry barriers in the creative market can be very low, really, so, and that's something which you need to take into account when you assess supply. The market is very skewed in terms of distribution of income. As you know, 95% of the musicians and of the creators cannot make a living only from their creativity. They have to get another job. And 5% get 95% of the income. So the market is not balanced, which means that uh, you have very different groups from the point of view of where can you put your risk and uh, how can you distribute your income. So that's that's important characteristic of the market. It's very uneven and unbalanced. And finally, cultural diversity is such that there will always be more offering. There will always be more songs and more books than what you can read and listen to. This means that there is an excess of supply of creative content. Unfortunately, this is bad news for the creators because this weakens their negotiating position, their bargaining position. That's why they need collecting societies to help them to negotiate better conditions of the use of their works. So these are the creative markets. And um, if I summarize now briefly what, in my view, are some of the main functions of copyright in the creative economy, I have spoken mostly about the economic side of it. And the most important economic function is that copyright functions as an enabler. It actually helps to create that framework which allows creative products to be traded on the market. It has the system of incentives and rewards. It allocates economic value and property rights. And to the extent to which this is a very precise economic category, we can use it as a basis for measurement. Now, in terms of social, um, uh, social functions, uh, copyright is a, is a, is a, is a concept uh, uh, which is about balancing uh, rights of access and rights of ownership through the system of uh, limitations and exceptions. So actually, it uh, seeks to ensure that balance in society, that society has access to some of the works and that the right holder has uh, the right to be remunerated for his work. It also supports um, innovation, and uh, copyright can be very helpful in terms of securing local and national development by providing some kind of security to the right holders in these communities. Finally, in terms of cultural function, uh, copyright helps 
and protects the creation of new cultural content, which means that it contributes to more cultural diversity. So um, if I would have to describe uh, what copyright can do in the economy, I would use a, a traffic, um, <coughs> a, I would use as a, an example a traffic situation. This is a, a typical traffic jam, could be in Madrid. I don't know whether we have traffic jams in Madrid, probably not. Uh, and uh, so this is a traffic jam and uh, you see here there's a policeman who has very limited chances of resolving uh, this uh, situation. Now imagine what's happening uh, in the information highway. There's a total jam all the time. And the only way to move forward is if you have a system of traffic lights. So what copyright is providing us is a system of traffic lights and you're hoping to get traffic lights and you're hoping to get something better than this. So, <clears throat> so much for some of the theoretical underpinnings. Let's now look at the um, issues of measurement. Why do we want to measure the creative sector? As I said to you, the request to us came from governments and they were interested in breaking down some of these complexities, putting a number. You see, Einstein said that uh, if you can't measure it, you can't understand it. And he also said that uh, everything can be counted, but not everything that can be counted counts. Fortunately, <laughs> creativity counts. So uh, people want to measure because they want to see whether they are better off compared to their competitors. What are the sectors where we are excelling? Where are the sectors wh where we are lagging behind? So uh, essentially this kind of research uh, supports uh, policy planning and is a policy tool. You would like to adjust your policies based on real evidence. What can you measure? As I said, you can measure everything under the sun. It's a matter of cost. If you have enough money and you have enough resources, you can probably measure everything. Now, in terms of uh, the creative industries, uh, we could look at uh, economic performance, we could look at economic impact, size, or we could look at economic contribution. Again, this contribution is very easy to, uh, to describe in terms of the, the enterprise of one unit. If you look at a micro level, it's much easier. But what about macro levels? What kind of data exists on macro levels? Then, we have direct revenues to the right holder, which is yet another side of the story. And you have total macroeconomic contribution, which comes from a statistical analysis. These are all different angles that you can apply to measurement. So, of course, we have chosen only one of them. Now, it's just a simple example of the different kind of direct copyright revenues that you can get. So you can just see how diverse things can, can be. If you're a pub, if you're, you can be receiving a royalty from a publisher, you can be getting a salary if you're a journalist in a newspaper, you can be getting a fee if you're a photographer, you can be getting a license if you're operating on the basis of a permission for using a work, you can be getting a direct income based on a right, let's say performing right. Remuneration can be something which you can be receiving from your CMO, Collective Management Organization, and there could be other revenues like the private copying compensation, which uh, is growing in some countries. I don't think it's growing here, but it's growing in some other European countries. So you have different direct copyright revenues. The problem is that it's very difficult to get information on all of those, especially in terms of the national economy. Now, the measurement model that we are applying in WIPO that many countries have adopted is a model which is based on, on copyright. What we are interested in is all the industries that depend on copyright, totally or partially. If it's partial, then we will try to estimate the portion which depends on copyright. But our model is based on this definition, copyright dependency. So in this way, we have no questions, uh, what are you measuring? Why are you measuring only this? There are countries in Europe which are focusing on uh, 
creative sector which compri is comprised of, um, let's say, 13 industries. How did you decide that it's 13 industries? Uh, it's a subjective choice. So what we do here is we take an objective criteria, we take level of dependency on copyright, and we map it out through the economy. As I said, it's a policy instrument, so basically we are providing information and evidence to politicians. Um, we are only looking at uh, official statistics. So in other words, if there are people who are operating in the grey economy, unfortunately their uh, contribution will not be captured. We are only interested in what is produced in official statistics. Why? Because it's done systematically according to an established pattern and because data is produced regularly so we can monitor. Uh, what we are also uh, looking in, doing in our model is we are looking on the production side of the economy. As you know, ideally, production and consumption should equal. However, data on production is more easily available than data on consumption. Consumption is more difficult to measure. But production data is available. That's why we are uh, looking at this side. Um, if uh, you take the creation process uh, of uh, work, um, in order to establish the comprehensive economic impact of that work, you need to go through the value chain. From the creation of the song until the moment when it can be consumed or listened to, there are many stages through which this product passes. So you need to format the song, you need to produce it, you need equipment for this, distribution, materials, marketing. Even in order to consume the song, you need equipment. So what I'm saying is that if we want to capture the comprehensive impact of copyright on the economy, we have to go through all of these stages and establish at all of these stages what kind of value is generated and what kind of jobs and what kind of trade. So indeed, these are the indicators that we looked at in the first place. What is value added as percentage of GDP? What is employment as percentage of national share of national employment? What is the foreign trade in terms of imports and exports? But in the process of the application of the methodology, we saw that countries were after more dynamic indicators. What is the productivity levels? What are the multipliers? In other words, uh, if you invest uh, X amount in the creative sector, how much more value or employment will you create compared to an investment in another similar sector or non-similar? What is the contribution to the real GDP growth? You know, the GDP grows, but where does the growth come from? So we are interested to what extent copyright contributes to that growth. Now, over the last 13 years, we have done some 50 studies based on this methodology. Um, or we have been involved in these 50, study, 50 countries. Some of the countries have done these studies more than once. So what is the uh, average as of this month? So we have about 5.16%. Um, this is the average contribution to the uh, GDP and 5.36% in terms of employment. So this is the average from these countries. And as I said, there are at least 10 countries which have produced more than two or three reports already based on this methodology. You see, only if you apply the same methodology, only then you can compare the results. Otherwise, there's no basis for comparison. Don't try to see the different countries and figures. I'll show them in the next slide. Uh, so this is GDP contribution. As you can see, the average, 75% of the countries are around the 5% uh, uh, average. And on top of our list, we have the United States and Korea. Uh, quite high results also for France and Australia from, and Hungary uh, from, the, um, uh, from the developed uh, and transition economies. Uh, down the list, we have countries like uh, Brunei, Jordan, Peru, Turkey, Ukraine. I mean, perhaps not a surprise. You would be surprised, why would Brunei want to have a study on the creative industries? And I'll tell you why. There are interesting stories behind each study. Brunei is totally dependent on gas and oil. And uh, the strategic task of the Sultan of Brunei 
is to find new sources of growth. So everything which is not related to gas and oil is a priority. So they took this study in order to take a benchmark to see where they stand. So each year now, when they do a study, they will be measuring against these benchmarks. So that's the reason why they got involved into this in the first place. And there is a story behind each and every, every study. Let's look at the employment contribution, completely different list of countries. On top of our list are developing countries, Philippines, Mexico, and Bhutan. Down the list, uh, again, Ukraine, Thailand, Jordan, okay, Argentina. Uh, actually, uh, it was surprising to many to see developing countries topping the list on employment, but there's an explanation to it. It turns out that many people outsource to Mexico and the Philippines, publications, uh, production of different things. So outsourcing creates jobs, but sometimes the products get assembled somewhere else. So the value doesn't show up in these countries, but they get the employment. And I'm telling you that employment is by far the most important social indicator. Governments fall on bad employment data. They don't always fall on bad GDP data. But employment is socially loaded. If you prove that you create employment, uh, you do get a lot of votes. Now, we can map out the contribution on this uh, quadrant, depending on employment and value. And uh, the value of this, uh, uh, of this chart is actually that uh, we can see how countries are moving with every new study. So we get a sense if they're moving into the high performance quadrant here with high share of GDP and high employment, or they still stay here where clearly they are not <coughs> yet achieving what they could. And uh, there are a lot of questions that can be asked. Why are we on that quadrant and not uh, here and not here? So you can, you can get an idea of, uh, of how the world is divided here. We can measure productivity with the caveat that this is only done in comparison to other industries and to see how do they compare with other industries in terms of productivity. I don't want to um, raise the productivity uh, to, to, to make it an absolute indicator because if I play... Um, a symphony twice faster, I will be twice more productive, but probably the outcome will not be the one that the audience expects from me, right? So productivity is something which should be taken with, uh, with, um, with, um, within this caveat. And you see that we have developing countries which are topping the list of productivity. Why is that so? Because most of the employment in these countries is in the gray economy. It's not official employment which means they don't show up in official statistics, which means that they seem to produce a lot with less. That's how your productivity gets higher. So data needs to be interpreted. Now, let's have a look at, uh, all right, we have data on what is the contribution of the creative sector. And I say that under creative sector, I understand creative industries supported by copyright. How does it compare with other macroeconomic indicators which exist and which are produced on a regular basis? The usual suspect is the GDP per capita. So what we want to see here is how does the contribution of the creative sector to GDP compare to the GDP per capita of the countries? And uh, what we see here is that there is a very high positive correlation between the two. What does that mean? That means that when one of the indicator changes, the other one changes in the same direction. In other words, countries where creative sector contributes a lot to the GDP tend to have a higher GDP per capita. So these indicators are linked. Let's look at another one, International Property Rights Index. That index is not prepared by us. Uh, it describes what is the level of property rights in the country. And again, you can see that we have a positive uh, relation, correlation, much less expressed than the GDP per capita, but still a positive one. Let's look at freedom from corruption. That's an important indicator. Again, done by someone else, not by us. But again, you can see that uh, there seems to be a positive correlation. If we have a well-performing creative sector, Usually, countries tend to have less corruption. 
we looked at the Global Innovation Index. That's an index prepared by WIPO and INSEAD. Um, and it's an index uh, which looks at uh, innovation in a broader sense, not only innovation in terms of research and development. Um, so there are quite a lot of uh, elements in, the, in this index. So we compared the two, and again, you saw very high level of uh, positive relationship. Same goes with the Global Competitiveness Index prepared by the World Economic Forum. Countries which have a well-performing creative sector seem to be doing better in terms of their global competitiveness levels. Foreign direct investment. Many developing countries are very interested in that indicator. Again, you can see that it is very high level of dependency. So investment goes usually where the creative sector seems to be performing well. Business freedom, how easy it is to do business in a country. These are indicators which are not prepared by us. We just try to track the level of relationship between our data and those existing indicators. And already for several years in a row, these relationships tend to be stable. So we've summarized them on this chart. And as you can see, it seems that uh, well-performing creative sector is uh, linked with uh, foreign direct investment, innovation, GDP per capita, competitiveness, business freedom, and freedom from corruption. And mostly the same relationships in relation to employment, a little bit lower levels of um, uh, positive relationship, but again, uh, pretty strong. Now, um, <clears throat> as I said in the beginning, we have uh, divided the industries uh, depending on their level of dependence on copyright. So there are industries which are totally dependent on copyright in terms of the, the production and distribution of copyright material. They exist basically and fundamentally in order to do that. In other words, without copyright, they would be considerably smaller or would not exist. We put these industries in the group of the core copyright industries. Everything else is non-core. So we have three other groups, which first one we call facilitating industries or interdependent. For example, this is the production of musical instruments. Can the production of musical instruments exist without copyright? Yes, of course it can. Does it make sense? Probably not very much because you use musical instruments to produce musical works. That's why we call them interdependent. Then we have the group of partial industries where copyright stands for a little portion of the activity. Let's say jewelry <coughs> or production of toys. What is protected is the design there. It's not the, the entire industry that can be counted within the creative sector. But uh, we take this, we, we weight the copyright dependence levels here. And finally, we, s we have something which is dealing with distribution. We call them uh, non-dedicated industries. Uh, this is basically to measure the spillover effects in other areas. For example, how much of the business of transportation is linked to transporting copyright products. These are secondary impacts. We're talking about fractions of the percentage, 0, 0.00 something. But distribution also concerns the internet. This is a major tool growing very fast, so the numbers are growing bigger. Now let's look in the core industry. How do the industries relate to each other? Which is the biggest sector? Uh, based on these 50 studies, almost without any exception, the biggest creative sector is the publishing sector. Publishing industry stands for about 36% of the core, followed by software, and then you have other industries such as radio and television, then you have uh, film, advertising, and music. So these are the top six in terms of value generation. In terms of employment, Pretty much the same picture, even more people, 40% are employed into the big publishing sector. This is by far the biggest industry. And uh, this is the one that should be cared for because uh, even if we have a lot of digital developments, it still remains a major uh, employer of, um, of workers. Uh, same industries follow, it's slightly different, sm slightly smaller proportions. Uh, again, software, we have radio and television, film, music, and advertising, by far the, the fastest growing is the advertising industry from all of these. Now, this is a slide uh, which I've called the creative DNA. 
you see, based on the <coughs> percentages coming from the different sectors in the core, you can see that each country is, has its own specifics. So it's a nice way of comparing where do these sectors stand. This is, for example, uh, the, <coughs> the, the strong uh, publishing sector. You can see in different countries it goes uh, way beyond 50%. But that's, uh, that's a nice way of representing how different we all are. How does copyright compare with other sectors of the economy? Well, it is important. If it's about 5% of the economy, I can tell you that this is more than agriculture, more than textiles, more than restaurants and hotels in many countries. You would not expect that, but this is what the data tells you. This is only a fraction of the countries. How does the developing world compare with the developed world and the transition economies? In fact, you will see that the differences are not that major. Transition countries and developing countries, practically the same. Uh, developed world, very small, less than a percentage difference. What is the, the conclusion? Well, perhaps this is the level playing field. Perhaps this is the area where the developing world may have a competitive edge. So there are, um, there are questions to be asked and there is analysis to be made. Uh, just one slide which is telling you how much of the content, um, uh, how much of the value is produced in the core sector and how much in the non-core sector. Uh, what this slide tells you is that, is that in the developed world, most of the value comes from the core sector. But in the developing world, the non-core sector is the one which is more, more important for them. Imagine the batik production in Indonesia. We will not count it 100% copyright dependent. Still, this is so big that for this country, this is a major, uh, a major tool of assessing the contribution of copyright. And that actually proves the point why is it more important to go beyond 13 sectors and to look into the value chain and go down levels of dependency, because then you will get the real result, which is quite impressive. Now, as I said, the perception is uh, indeed, it's a significant contribution. Many people did not expect that when they started off the studies. Uh, it means that this is significant. We need to care for this sector. If it provides for 5% of the jobs in the country, you cannot ignore it. Uh, the dynamics is impressive. It's uh, about 2.5 times higher than the average for the economy. So this sector grows very high, very, very fast. Um, it's also higher uh, capital and labor productivity. And most importantly, the multipliers in this industry, uh, industries are uh, very high. I can tell you that in the Jamaica study that we did, the output, uh, multi the, the employment multiplier for the creative sector was about uh, six times higher than the uh, employment multiplier for the sugarcane industry. Uh, when a government needs to take a decision on where to invest, you would invest in a sector which will create more jobs for you. So this is the kind of data which can help you to argument these kind of, of decisions. Uh, yes, and we can go further into that analysis, but I don't think that we have uh, enough time to do that. I'd like to mention a few words about the misperceptions. And we have seen that in a number of developing countries in particular. Uh, and the biggest uh, misperception is that uh, creativity on its own can lead to economic growth. This is not the case. You do need infrastructure around that. You need to have a functioning system which can bring back the benefit to the creator. You need a system of collecting society to function well. Otherwise, you may have great creative assets, but they cannot be turned into economic assets. Uh, another misperception is that uh, we can do well only in this sector. This is not possible. The creative sector is dependent on the rest of the economy. It is very well linked, interlinked with all parts of the economy. So um, another misperception uh, is that there is one institution which is responsible for the creative sector. It is not so. It is not only the Ministry of Culture, and Adriana on herself cannot solve the problems of the creative industries in, in, in Spain, if you have any. Now, the, another misperception is that the creative sector and its contribution is constantly growing. Uh, 
this, uh, the, sometimes people turn this into an absolute idea. We should be growing all the time. How much can you grow? How much do you want to grow? You want to grow to 100%? It doesn't make any sense. It becomes a chase of numbers. There was a government which said next year or the next five years we want to reach 20% contribution of our uh, sector. Um, so mm, the result of this, uh, I, I think, is not very healthy because we've seen then some fiddling with numbers uh, and then some unhealthy processes developing if you're chasing the numbers. So I don't think this should be the objective. Um, I think that another misperception is, of course, that uh, mm, creative industries can solve all of our problems. There are structural problems in the economy. They cannot be solved by the creative sector. The creative sector can help to some extent, but don't blame it all on the creative industries. They just cannot be the fire brigade, as I said in the beginning. And one thing which um, uh, I'm particularly attached to is to underline that uh, you cannot put uh, an equation um, and you cannot say that uh, everything which is digital is creative. Uh, there is a big difference between digital and creative, and the digital economy and the creative economy is not the same. So uh, we're not here after technology, we're after content. Uh, so what are some of the risks that you have? You adopt the concept of creative industries because it's very fancy. You would like to uh, be a creative economy, and you would like this economy to develop very fast. Um, but the data doesn't seem to prove the case. What do you do then? And we are in this position when we have to match the level of expectation with the level of the result which we have received. There are different ways of doing it. You can be constructive and create a plan. This is what I'm going to do to improve. Or you can become pessimistic and say, this is not important for me. I don't care about this sector. So we've seen both. Uh, setting unrealistic targets, as I said. Well, some people say next year we will grow by 10%. I mean, this is not the idea. What you want to do is to develop all the structures to develop uh, the potential of the industry and then see the result, not to say that I need 5% and I'll make it no matter what, which one country did, by the way. So there are countries which are adopting this concept, uh, in fact, without underlying economic growth. There needs to be growth. If you want the sector to grow, there need to be some underlying economic factors. You need to have some statistical capacity, you need to have some data, and you need to have a functioning infrastructure in place. At the end, I'd like to mention a few uh, uh, other um, projects in WIPO which have a relevance uh, to assessing the performance of the creative sector. Um, as I said, it's a matter of getting data. What kind of data do we produce which might be useful to you in your research work in your future activities. <coughs> um, since three years, we are doing an international survey on private copying levies. That's an interesting in income source in more than 35 countries around the world. And some countries are considering making the system operational. So we provide them with this very detailed report on country per country, carrier by carrier, very detailed information. I can advise you to have a look at it on the website. By the way, all of the studies by countries are on the website. Secondly, we have an international survey on text and image levies. Also something which, uh, information which is not publicly available. And that's another source of information. We are completing now the second uh, annual report together with IFRO. We are also doing a study on uh, the economic importance of collective management with CISAC. That should be an interesting one when we complete it. I hope we can share with you the results next year. Um, we also study you know, broader copyright impacts. We are currently doing an interesting project with Finland to see what are some of the social and cultural and economic impacts of uh, the uh, research exception in Finnish copyright law. Research exception is something which is very high on the agenda right now. So the law is about to be modified in that country. And the government uh, is working together with us to assess what would be the likely scenarios from different levels of adjustment of the law. And that will give you, a, you know, impact is always the difference between two states, right? So you take the status now and then you implement the law and then you see what's the impact. That's the only way of measuring properly impacts. And uh, finally, we have, um, 
um, several interesting tools for creators in specific creative sectors, uh, which are basically telling the layman in the industry how to make a living from his or her creativity. Uh, how do you manage your rights in the music industry? How do you manage your rights in the in the video game industry, etc. So all of these are available on the website. Uh, this is what they look like, uh, and they are downloadable for free. So uh, looking ahead, uh, I think that uh, we've come to a point when the the creative industries have uh, become something uh, very attractive to most governments. It's a concept which has come here to stay. And now is the right time for this concept to develop. So it, um, it is being adopted by many as a strategy. They say for us, the way forward is developing the creative economy. Many countries are saying that. And this is a good moment for all of us working in copyright, which supports the creative sector in such a, an important way. Um, as I said, there are definitional um, differences. Uh, uh, our colleagues from UNESCO don't speak of creative industries, they speak of cultural industries. And uh, the difference is that <laughs> tiny, well, software is not cultural, they say. We believe it is creative, and we believe it operates on the basis of copyright, etc. So there are definitional issues. Colleagues in UNCTAD, uh, the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, they look through the trade prism, etc., uh, etc. Et there are many players in the UN and outside the UN. So unfortunately, these definitional differences are likely to continue for a while. So that may prevent us from adopting a universal approach to some of these issues. Uh, I think that the central issue now is uh, not whether you're creative or not, but how to monetize your creati creativity. How can you actually capitalize on creativity? How can you turn this into something which can work for you and for the economy. And the whole focus is now on this monetizing creativity, monetizing creativity. I think this is the likely topic to stay. Um, as I said, I don't believe that we should consider creative industries as responsible for solving all problems. Um, and I think that uh, it's very important to continue to uh, provide uh, policy makers and researchers with solid empirical evidence, because that's the only way that you can actually convince people that uh, this is important. Um, so this summarizes uh, what I've already said. Uh, I believe it is the time now to capitalize on this high profile. Uh, creative industries is very important. Is it going to be like this for the next 50 years? Probably not. Probably we are now in this cycle of time when we can really make use of this concept to drive economic, social, and cultural development. Uh, clearly, global solutions, uh, we operate on a global market. There's no way we can solve problems in one country. Uh, and um, again, piracy. We have to work on this level of acceptance of, uh, of uh, intellectual property in society. Otherwise, cultural content is going down, and society is going to feel that uh, uh, negatively. Uh, economic, I already mentioned, and in terms of research, I believe that uh, I have uh, presented to you one of the approaches of measuring the creative industries and the creative economy. There are other approaches out there. The WIPO approach is only one of these. Um, it, um, I believe that inevitably in the future we are coming to a new generation of indicators. We will have more dynamic indicators. We will have uh, uh, more uh, ways of fine-tuning our research because uh, creativity and creative industries are spreading over so much uh, and because industries now today are developing in such a way that some of the boundaries are withered. Uh, so it's very difficult uh, today to say that our, uh, our studies are providing a 100% precise measurement. There's probably much more than that. But we have to figure out how to come up with a solid economic model which allows us to stand for the result that we will obtain through future studies. And uh, at the end, muchas gracias. Yeah. Uh, I, do, I know that you have some questions, so I'm open to your questions.
Muchísimas gracias, Dimitri, por haber abierto esta ventana a, a todo lo que el desarrollo de, de la, del sector de la propiedad intelectual mmm, tiene en relación con la economía y la industria y, y el desarrollo de, nuestro, de nuestros países en, en general. Yo tenía dos preguntas concretas que, que hacerte. Una, bueno, las dos son en relación con los estudios eh, que desarrolla la OMPI. Y quisiera preguntar si habéis podido identificar también en estos análisis eh, país por país el, la relación que hay entre el desarrollo, eh, o sea, la aportación al PIB y la aportación al empleo en cada país con el desarrollo de una legislación de propiedad intelectual eh, amplia y, y con un con unas raíces eh, eh, consolidadas, es decir, en aquellos países donde hay una legislación de propiedad intelectual eh, solvente, es también en los países en, en donde hay un mayor grado de desarrollo, de aportación al PIB y, a, y al empleo. Y luego, por otro lado, también quería preguntar si eh, en el seguimiento que hacéis de estos estudios país por país, habéis podido también ver eh, si los países, cómo, mejor dicho, cómo reaccionan los países a, a, al ver estos, estos resultados en los estudios eh, que se plasman en, en cifras y si, a, y si podéis también eh, ver si se toman medidas políticas eh, en reacción a estos, a estos estudios por parte de, de estos países. Es decir, si realmente eh, influyen en las, en las políticas que los países desarrollan para potenciar sus industrias culturales y creativas. Gracias. Dos uh, uh, excelentes preguntas. Um, I think that um, on the first one, uh, uh, let me clarify, the kind of studies that we do, they're providing you with a snapshot of the situation. We are telling you this is what is the overall contribution of the industries which are supported by copyright at this given moment of time. And the value, the big value of this research is that uh, Uh, if you apply the same methodology, you're able to capture the processes. You're able to monitor. Is it going up or down? Because as I said, we cannot be sure that we are down to the penny exact in the projection. But if you're applying the same methodology, you've taken the benchmark, so with every new study, you get interesting information on what are the tendencies, what is happening in the different sectors. Now, your question goes one level deeper. How is this performance linked to the existing copyright regime in that country? And here, the evidence is indirect. I cannot tell you that because this country uh, has a great copyright law, that is why the sector is performing well. Because for me to answer this question, this implies that I would be able to prove the causality between the two. Uh, which I'm not able to do, which I am going to do through impact studies. This is the next level of studies. Um, I can make broad conclusions, but you're asking me a very specific question, and to answer it specifically, I need to prove it through a study. That would be uh, my answer to this question. Of course, you could create, and we are thinking about that, you could create something like an index. An index is uh, usually you resort to an index, when you do not have sufficient amount of direct data. And maybe some of the data will be qualitative data, not only quantitative. Then you put it in an index and you measure against the index. So there are ways of doing it. But again, this is another level of research, another dimension. On your second question, how countries take the results, I can um, distinguish about four different levels of reaction to these studies. Uh, the first level is uh, uh, when governments are slightly disappointed with the not so great result, uh, and they put it on the shelf. The publication is on the shelf. Um, WIPO publishes the report, and done deal, finished. That's level one. Now, uh, level two is uh, when we have a government which uh, says, okay, well, this report gives us a lot of food for thought. There are many issues which need to be addressed. We would like uh, to organize a presentation of this report to the right holders, to the government, to the policy people, 
and we organize an event, we have a conference, and there is a debate, and maybe something happens. The third level is a country which uh, takes this report very seriously, and they, um, they, every report, by the way, has a policy recommendation part in the end, which, is, uh, which allows you to operationalize it in the future. But on this third level, the governments would say, well, um, okay, uh, we see that the um, uh, publishing sector is still very important for us, for example, but we also see that it's, uh, it's going down, taken up by radio and television. This is the case of Mexico. And they said, we would like you to help us uh, by following up with a specific study on the publishing industry in Mexico, because we want to know what is happening there, what are the bottlenecks. If it stands for uh, so much of the employment in the country, we need to be able to address the issues there. And at the same time, see why is it losing to radio and television so much. We follow up with further studies as per the request of the government. And the fourth level is when you have a, a wonderful level of commitment. Then the government uh, takes the report, takes the recommendations, takes the data, and then they would um, establish a serious monitoring mechanism, something like uh, an observatory, to measure this on a yearly basis or every two years. Uh, then they would um, uh, even sometimes resort to looking into how to build this, um, um, con this evidence into a national strategy for the development of the creative sector. And we have seen several such strategies emerging based on these reports, which is a great joy to all of us that this work actually has some real life consequences. There are many countries which are uh, doing strategies, but I always tell them uh, we would not engage in developing a strategy without having this report. We have to base this strategy on something, and I think this is the first level when you get a sense of where do you stand. So there are different levels of commitment and uh, uh, incredible interest in Latin America, growing interest we have done in several countries in Latin America. And even if uh, not all of the results are outstanding, they want to turn this into uh, something very, uh, very constructive and engage with us in further action. Sometimes there could be, uh, very often one of the conclusions is apparently we are collecting very little collective management doesn't function well. What do we need to do? Or why are we losing so much? And then one of the factors is piracy, of course. What do you need to do about piracy? But this is a whole new chapter. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Muchas gracias, Dimitri, muy interesante. La verdad es que a mí me han surgido muchísimas preguntas, ¿no? pero un poco por, por no extenderme voy a hacer una que la verdad es que sí me interesa, además después de haber visto algunos de los estudios que están en, en vuestra agenda, el relacionado con eh, gestión colectiva de derechos. Me pregunto si dentro de ese estudio eh, vais a tratar el valor, de, por un lado, que tienen los derechos de autor propiamente dichos y el de los derechos conexos. Me surgen, bueno, pues ahora por ejemplo en Estados Unidos eh, los compositores han, han luchado bastante por eh, llegar a introducir un proyecto de ley para lograr equiparar el valor de derechos de autor eh, bueno, pues con el valor de, de los derechos sobre los fonogramas, ¿no? Que los productores resulta pues que allí están teniendo, bueno, pues la, las tarifas están siendo bastante elevadas, pero es, la justificación es legal. Es una, viene de la ley, viene de resoluciones del Copyright Royalty Board de, de Estados Unidos. Luego, por otro lado, en el caso opuesto, en, me refiero a que los derechos de autor sean eh, superiores al valor de derechos conexos en Suiza. En Suiza, por ejemplo, de hecho está regulado legalmente, hay un split que si no recuerdo mal es de un 10%. Eh, los titulares de derechos de autor pueden llegar a, a recaudar pues, hasta un 10% como máximo de los ingresos que generen los usuarios por el uso de composiciones y de un 3% en el caso de derechos conexos. Hay mucha, eh, bueno, es una divergencia ¿no? de... En Suiza es, eh, son más elevados las, los derechos de autor, en Estados Unidos son más elevados los derechos conexos. ¿Crees que el, eh, esta labor de los legisladores eh, dificulta, supone alguna barrera al desarrollo, al correcto desarrollo de las industrias culturales? 
¿Qué opinión te merece eh, esta eh, diferencia de valores ¿no? entre derechos de autor y derechos conexos? Gracias. Um, thank you for this question, very interesting question. I am not sure I can answer fully your question, uh, but let me give you my 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 take on that. Uh, first of all, uh, copyright and related rights. Um, um, I must say that when I say copyright, I always refer to related rights as well. Uh, we very often use this as a shortened expression of copyright and related rights which is not fair to related rights, I know, I apologize for that, but uh, it was not meant to undermine the importance of, of related rights. In the study which we are doing with CISAC, uh, it is going to be an economic study, and we certainly do want to look into related rights as well. Uh, it all depends on the information that we will be able to get. Uh, the data, it's all about data. Uh, you see, we have... Um, uh, economic models, uh, we can provide expertise, um, but um, a lot of the data is available only at CISAC level or other um, similar federations level. So we have to cooperate with them to get the data to do the analysis in such a way that uh, we are all happy with it and it proves and it shows the tendencies that we want to, to see. Uh, we still have some methodological issues, uh, we are still discussing it, uh, because it, it, it has not been done so far, such a study on the economic importance of collective management, and we really want to, be, um, we really want to do something serious. Uh, now, we're hoping that, by the way, it will be ready next year, so mm, we're currently discussing. Um, on your second question, uh, it's, a, mm, it's a difficult question. Uh, from a WIPO perspective, you see what WIPO's mandate is, is we're trying to harmonize the laws on international level. Why? Because you need similar terms of trade. Uh, countries need to be comfortable that the copyright regime in the countries with which they will be trading will be more or less similar. And there's a great similarity in many countries. Now, in terms of provisions of the law, etc. Now, when you come to this... Uh, a very detailed uh, uh, question of, of ra rates, royalty rates, uh, setting uh, royalties and all that, uh, you have a lot of uh, national differences, different approaches, and they're linked uh, to culture, tradition, specifics of the country. Uh, I don't think that there is any attempt to harmonize that on international level. Um, of course, one could learn from best practices, but there's nobody who can impose on country X to adopt whatever works in country Y. Um, I, I don't know whether I can answer that question any better than that. Uh, there are wonderful best practices, and what WIPO can do, I'm thinking of it now, is we can try to provide you with all of these best practices, and you take your decisions based on that. Um, it's very difficult to promote uh, international legislation in such a narrow field. As I said, there are a lot of complexities around it. Um, different approaches, countries want to learn, but sometimes things are not directly applicable. Um, I, uh, I think that there's a, there's a great area where a lot more can be done so that people are better informed on what's happening around the world, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And then whether this is applicable in your country, you'll have to see with your own legislators and managers of um, collective management organizations. Well, in any case, you have my email address, so... No, digo que están reflexionando mucho sobre todo lo que han escuchado esta mañana. Um, creo que no hay más preguntas, Dimiter. Así que lo dejamos aquí. Muchísimas gracias por tu tiempo y por tu dedicación. Y, y eres bienvenido siempre que quieras a estas Masterclass. Muchas gracias. gracias.